Greetings in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I am facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found on the list of study groups on the LNL research website page shown on your screen. We do also have a Facebook group and we do also meet on Zoom twice a week at the times that you see on your screen. Uh, you don't have to live in the Seattle area or anywhere near the Seattle area to join our Facebook group or join our Zoom sessions. Anyone who's interested is available. Best uh, way to do that is just uh, contact us at the email shown on your screen and we'll add you to our mailing list and you can get uh, weekly emails to let you know what we are doing that week and include these Zoom links as well. We do also have a YouTube channel where you can find episodes of our brand new Seattle Law of One podcast series, as well as Q&As with Jim McCarty and Gary and Trisha and Austin of the LNL research uh, channeling team. Did want to let you know that if you are watching any of these on your TV, you can skip ahead by chapters if you don't necessarily want to watch the whole two hours of it uh, from beginning to end. Uh, you can skip through and uh, by chapter by chapter and topic by topic if you want. Uh, if you are watching it on your computer, if you click on the video link, you should see a list of topics and timestamps below the uh, video window, and you can click on any of the timestamps by uh, topics if you want to skip through there. Uh, otherwise, we are lucky today and blessed today to be joined once again by Austin Bridges and Gary Bean to have some informal conversation, question and answers about the law of one and how to live it in our daily lives. How are you doing, gentlemen? Doing great. <laughs> How are you doing, Austin? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for inviting us as always. It's always such an honor to be here and to see all of your amazing faces and be in this space with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We all edit out the awkward silence at the beginning there. No, you have to How are you doing? In. Yeah. <laughs> I am generally too lazy to edit out anything that I don't absolutely have to, but we might uh, go for it on that one. How are you doing, Gary? Uh, me, I'm just being punctual. I don't know about <laughs> everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> punctual when communication is uh, uh, accurate. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm just riffing on uh, Jonathan there. I'm doing well. I recognize uh, at least half the people here. We've crossed paths before at various gatherings. Hello, everybody. It's like Austin said, an honor to be here, to be challenged by these questions um, and to do our best to offer something to, to think about, to be a focal point for everybody's inquiry. Nice. Well, we sure do appreciate your being here. Uh, and I understand uh, Trish was not able to join us today, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was going to make some joke about. Uh, <laughs> you definitely hatred, should. I'm sure she will appreciate that. Her hatred, deep hatred of humanity and seeing. <laughs> and then I <laughs> held back. Um, yeah, she. she uh, is having a, a Trish has a long medical history, and uh, among the various things that occur to her, uh, some of which are mysterious, includes a recent allergy. Her face just swelled up, and her eyes were all puffy, and she looked like a different person. Um, and it's only mildly painful, but um, she looks looks like a swollen tomato. So she prefers not to not to join the the Zoom call like that. So she sends as about, entertaining as it would be for all the rest of us. I'm right? glad that she is doing that wee little bit of self-care there. Self-care. Well, uh, send her our love and tell her uh, we all wish her uh, nothing but the best for healing in mind and body and spirit. And uh, yeah, not the least bit surprising that she might be grappling with all sorts of catalysts following the coming home events. The East Coast coming home event in Philly was just uh, like barely a week ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, unknown to uh, everybody else there, she had to retreat multiple times just to sequester herself in the room to recoup some of her, her energies. And in addition to her normal medical stuff, she was undernourished. And she would really appreciate me saying that right now. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> in other words, I'm, I'm calling. But she's probably not going to watch this anyway, so I'm, I'm not sure she's got better her. things to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how about some uh, thoughts, reflections, stories from the East Coast gathering first and then the West Coast gathering also, which happened uh, sometime after the last time we saw you guys? Yeah. Uh, would you mind uh, starting off, uh, Gary, and then Austin? 
Sure, sure. I, I will speak to the East Coast and then Austin to uh, can speak to the West Coast. It, it was fantastic. It was our first time in Philly, first time at this event. Uh, Pendle Hill, if you're unfamiliar, probably are, uh, was, I think, built by Quakers, but it's definitely been maintained by Quakers since since I don't the a long time, many decades. And this is a, a Christian rel religious group that's famous for being egalitarian and pacifistic. And in fact, I think the first abolitionists in the country or among the first came out of the Quakers, you know, those who spoke out against slavery in, in, in America. So that, as you can imagine, uh, you know, if you believe in metaphysics, really contributes to the, the psychic air there. And it's sort of, it's a campus setting. It's very forested. So surrounded by many tall trees. Um, the buildings are these own old stone, large sort of cottagey sort of buildings. And the staff is really great. There were over 20 new faces, as I was uh, uh, telling you, uh, Jonathan. And as, as happens reliably, I mean, without exception at every one of these events, People reported life-changing, uh, transformative experiences, and not because LL Research was there, uh, but because of the the sacred space of coming together in, in the open heart. And everything went well logistically. Uh, Trisha and I channeled for the first time, just the two of us, without Austin or Jim, which was nerve-wracking, but, but we did it, met lots of new people, and... Um, yeah, yeah, lots of little details, but we just fell in love with everybody who was there. What a beautiful sharing. Thank you so much. It sounds wonderful. Uh, Austin, any thoughts, reflections from the West Coast gathering? I know you had uh, other commitments during the uh, East Coast gathering this time. Yeah, um, the West Coast gathering was, I assume, equally as amazing, even though I didn't join the East Coast gathering. Um, it was it was really cool. So last year was our first time going to the West Coast outside of Seattle. And we realized naturally that that opens up the availability of the gathering to an entire section of a population on the west side of the country and um, up in Canada even. And so there were lots of people that um, were really grateful that we went out there. And so we returned and there were a lot of returning faces from the previous year. Uh, so there was a great sense of returning community. There are also lots of new people, uh, but a great sense of community, um, like people that became friends last year were able to see each other again so immediately the vibes were super high and we had a new venue and i think the venue itself created a really magical element it was uh incredibly beautiful you know if anybody uh, a lot of you are probably from the pacific northwest so uh you know how beautiful it is there but it is a unique beauty and we were nestled right in the heart of um just nature and it was incredible and i think one of the things that really stood out for this year was a theme of music sort of came up for the whole weekend. Um, I unfortunately missed it, but there was one night where there were a bunch of musicians in the group that there's a circle that kind of evolved into kind of a musical talent show. And um, it was, it created this theme where a lot of music was talked about a lot through the weekend. And then that also culminated in a question about music being asked of Kuo. So I'd say uh, music was the theme for the weekend. And Elaine, who is on the call, was one of those fantastic musicians who has produced her own or written her own albums, which is coming out soon or is already uh, is coming out soon, I think, and uh, was an incredible performer. And I just want to give a shout out to Miles because he, ah, oh, it's caught on my shirt, created um, this stone necklace. Oh, nice. He's not everybody there and... Thank you, Miles, very much. If you oh, have. he'll appreciate seeing you wearing that. That's wonderful. Thank you. And Matthew was here. Matthew yes, uh, was is here by name. We can't see his face, but he was where, a big highlight of the music. He's there. Hi, Matthew. Yeah. yeah, we see you, Matthew. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and his incredible, beautiful music too, yeah. Matthew. Such uh, a gift. Fred is asking in the chat window how many people attend the gatherings, and it was like uh, uh, almost 40 on the West Coast, right? And it was about how many in Philly? Yeah, uh, West Coast was after a few last minute cancellations, 42. And like, funny enough, same with East Coast after a couple few last minute cancellations, 42, 43, I think. 
it's a really special chance for people to meet up in person. And even if you cannot attend either of those events, just gatherings in person with anyone who is, you know, within driving distance of where you live uh, can be a really special thing. Uh, before we move on to other topics, uh, Gary or Austin, whoever's better able to answer this question, uh, for folks who are watching this who would like to attend gatherings in the future, what would be the best advice for them? Mm. <laughs> I guess uh, because they fill up pretty quickly, um, but I think one of the best things you can do to stay abreast of information, such as save the dates, and actual registrations is to register for our gatherings newsletter on our website uh, is under the library on our website under newsletters. And that's typically where we send out any announcements that have to do with gatherings and uh, you can get like save the dates and figure out when we might announce registration. Um, other than that, I'm not sure, Gary. And if you have a retreat center that you are aware of in this country, let us know. Like, in fact, we prefer that the coming home gatherings be about 55 people. But Rainbow Lodge on the West Coast, Pendle Hill on the East Coast had a cap of 45 due to the limits of the main meeting space. But anyways, we're always interested in exploring new regions of the country because it's been proven when we move to a new area of the country, it opens up the circle to a whole new region. And Trish has scouted out probably about 40 different venues across the country at this point. And most just do not work. It's rare that someone can, some venue can really fit the bill. So if you're aware of something, even if you're watching this a couple of years from now, please let us know. <laughs> Indeed. We're always thinking forward in time for sure. Yeah, well, uh, uh, kudos and thank you to uh, Trish, especially for doing the vast majority of the work and organizing these these events. Uh, but for everyone there, uh, Austin, Trish, uh, Gary, um, uh, I believe last year was the first time you had an event like west of Louisville. So just coming all the way out to Seattle was a big deal. Uh, and then I think your previous events were all in Nashville, North Carolina. So Philly is a new thing too. And yeah, yeah who knows? Southwest, Midwest, who knows? Would be uh, great. But appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, I do see a good number of questions in the chat window, so I did want to make sure that we have a chance to get to those. Uh, I've got Langley, Joyce, and Grace up in the first three. Before we do that, I did have a question that I wanted to ask you about Quo. Uh, for those of our viewers who are new to the Law of One, and I'm only realizing after doing these podcasts now that it's really helpful to uh, make sure that we clue in folks who are new to the law of one as much as possible so they understand the things that we're talking about. Uh, if you know who Ra is, uh, then the entity known as Kuo is a group entity made up of Ra at sixth density, Latwi at fifth density, and Hatan at fourth density. So these are actually three planetary consciousnesses, three social memory complexes. They're all kind of merged together, working uh, together on this. First contact with this entity, Quo was made in 1986, about two years after the end of the raw contact. And uh, they have been channeled by the LNL channeling team at least once, twice a month, every year since then, all the way up to this year and like last month, I think. Um, so having said that, uh, for Gary and Austin, I had a question. I, I, uh, I think all of our uh, viewers, anyone who's read the channelings, notices that uh, Quo always starts any of their responses with the phrase, I am Quo and am aware of your query. Any thoughts on why that is in particular? Is it kind of a priming of the pump for the channel? Does it give you like the first words or thoughts to grab onto the first thread in that concept ball to pull out? Or is it a sort of tuning process? Can you share a little bit about why you think that Quo always starts off the responses that way? Uh, how about if we start with Austin this time? That's actually a really good question. I haven't really thought about that. I think for me and Gary, it's a bit of a unique experience because we learned how to channel long after sort of these patterns had been established in Kuo's channeling. And so already in our mind, there are these neural pathways of like, this is how Kuo talks. This is how, what Kuo says. And in my conception of how channeling works is they really utilize those 
things that are present to be able to speak through you. And so already in my mind, that's how Kuo starts answers. And so Kuo will naturally start answers that way uh, when I'm channeling Kuo. Where that started, though, where that came from, um, I can only guess that sometimes as an instrument, um, the the query can get confused and, you know, that can if the confusion in the instrument can uh, cause confusion in the channeling as well. Um, as much as we try to step back and being an active participant in the channeling, it's inevitable that, you know, our own mental processes are unfolding at the same time. And we have to do this dance with Kuo, as Kuo sort of calls it. And so it maybe started as a way to just confirm that, uh, yes, the question was perceived by Kuo, by the instrument that it's been received, and um, they are aware of it and they can respond to it now, whereas sometimes they might ask for clarification. But uh, not sure why it specifically is there aware of it and um, why it has been so consistent. That all makes perfect sense, though. Yeah, appreciate that. Gary, any thoughts on that? Agree, yeah, disagree, just, anything else? I mean, they, they respond that way because they are quo and they are aware <laughs> of the query. <laughs> As opposed to I am Latwee and what? <laughs> you know, when, when your kids ask you a question, you don't respond that way. So, <laughs> what do I, you think the answer is to that query? I am dead. In the Darth Vader voice, I am your father. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I appreciate I, Austin spoke really well. I, I don't have anything further to add. Sounds good. Well, uh, do you have some questions in the chat window? And I do want to make sure that we have time to get to those. Uh, Wes, I believe you had a clarification question. Yes. Excuse me. Um, I had heard that uh, there was some inclination to respond with the, the affirmation that I am Ra, I am Quo, because of the possibility that if the, if the um, connection were distorted, that a negative entity could insert itself in there and that that affirmation uh, just lets the instrument and the audience know that this is indeed who is speaking rather than some other entity trying to usurp the, the uh, contact. Is there any, any basis to that idea? That, that's been part of my vague understanding regarding Ra specifically, and I don't see uh, why it also couldn't be extended to the consciously channeled sources and is probably mentioned somewhere in that vast oceanic library. Um, I think what you said is true, Wes, though I have to speculate. And by the way, good to see you. I haven't seen you since last year. I speculate that uh, it may of itself not be bulletproof in that if the source, rather, if the instrument becomes detuned and thus is receiving a mixture of positive and negative, I don't see why a negative entity couldn't ape that calling card, but uh, maybe it is a, a sort of guarantee that if you are hearing the source identify itself. I mean, let me take, let me actually... Uh, uh, take that back because when you consider that Yahweh, according to Ra, was uh, aped by and became a negatively oriented entity and used the very same name. And right. just, so far as the what we would now call the Israeli, uh, is, Israeli the people of that region <laughs> were concerned, uh, it was Yahweh on the line using the, the, the same name. So... That's what I was thinking. I mean, if they can mimic the vibrational signature close right. enough to fool you, then surely they can say the same opening line and tagline. That probably not that difficult to do. Uh, Neely, yet another follow up question. Yeah, I mean that brings up to mind why at the beginning of the connection, the contact with Ra, some of, some of Ra's answers didn't have "I am Ra." I was kind of thinking about it and maybe it was because it was answers to questions that were about transient transient uh, topics or I couldn't find any consistency there. Do you have any thoughts with regarding to that? Uh, same as you, I tried to find any kind of connecting 
fabric between why particular questions they didn't start with I am raw and I couldn't see anything that seemed to indicate detuning well in some of them it's you know the session seems a little detuned but not all of them and so uh, it's not consistent across the board uh, so it is a bit of a confusing thing I have noticed a really really small number of sessions where as far as I can tell quote did not open with their usual disclaimer about, you know, take what resonates with you and discard the rest, which in my mind, I question whether that might be uh, then a possibly uh, a, 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 a false channeling. Have, uh, you don't have any thoughts on that, do you? Probably making more of that than w would be called for. I would say that idea uh, it makes sense, but it gives me as an instrument a bit of anxiety because I do know that like things can sort of, you know, they can pass us a ball and we'll miss it. And so yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't read too much into it, but, you know, yeah. little hints like that could be a way to examine the information that's coming through. I just know that I always appreciate it. I always know that when I see that little disclaimer at the beginning and somehow after 1600 plus channels, they always find a slightly different way to say it, slightly different wording. It always gives me a little bit of comfort when I read it. So, hey, I do want to go ahead and move ahead to the questions in the chat window. And Langley, I believe you had two questions. Do you want to start with your first question? And yeah. then after we go all the way through, we could double back to you. Sounds good. Uh, hi guys, my question is about soul contracts and we make soul contracts with other entities to sometimes get our ass kicked down here, um, but they are service to others, like they're, they're others that are like us. Do we make soul contracts with service to self entities as what the Ra or Quo kind of touched on that subject at all. Gary, if you understand the question, do you want to start off with that yeah, one? I'm not totally. sure if I understand the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a fantastic question, Langley. Thank you. Uh, do, you know, those key figures in our life are those with whom, particularly the more we progress along the path, that we have made agreements with in the pre-incarnational state. Like, you're going to be my mother. Uh, I'm going to be your business partner in this venture. We're going to be lovers. Maybe even we'll be antagonists on some level. Or, or And through these relationships where we kind of, you know, quote unquote, contractually create an arrangement together, we are able to facilitate key lessons that we want to learn and the other people with whom we are contracted, what they want to learn. But Langley's asking, can we make these same agreements with a service? Can those of the service to others polarity make the agreement with the service to self polarity on a pre-incarnational level such that when they come into the incarnation, they are bound together by this pre-incarnational agreement? And I have no data on the question. In fact, I would love to know myself, but um, just on the basis of thinking out loud my understanding is that our inner planes you know that that the subtle realms to which the recently deceased soul goes in between lives is a polarized space uh so that you know there's a, a positive place and a negative place this is why in my conjecture when reading books like michael newton brian weiss and others who regress people you don't see people dedicated to the dark arts. You don't see service to self people because the people being regressed are on the positive path. In fact, they're in that hypnotist office because they're positively oriented people. Uh, so, which leads me to believe that the, the, the processes of the service to self entity are happening elsewhere in, in another space. And I can't imagine um, cooperation for the mutual benefit of both happening across that divide of those polarized uh, spaces. However, they're going to intersect. They're going to collide potentially in some way, whether it's the service to others, like resisting the service to self or the service to self trying to conquer and subjugate the service to others. 
so there must be some kind of uh, deeper coordination, or maybe it's just the- But if they're on different paths, if one is on the STO path and the other is on the STS path, then they wouldn't even be in the same soul groups, would they? It seems that, I don't know, it seems like they would just be in totally different soul groups. I think that's a true statement, yeah. But, you know, we are shaping our incarnational experience according to the exercise of our free will on the incarnate level, on the pre-incarnational level, and so forth. And there's a physics to that. There's a, a, a electromagnetism to that. So we might draw those opportunities to us whereby we're colliding with the service of self-entity and uh, oh, vice versa. that makes sense. So both of the, I mean, the polarities have to relate in some way to give each other the opportunity to polarize along their, their own path. So yeah. that's a good point and way above either of our pay grades. I think uh, Austin, yeah. did, you have, did you have any thoughts on that? And then uh, Langley, if you wanted to follow up. Yeah, I generally agree with uh, Gary's answer. I think a couple of points that come to mind are the situation in the raw contact um, without explaining the whole thing, but Don was trying to find a way where he could serve the negative entity that was greeting them during the raw contact. And Ra, in one of their responses, described how there are these two separate aspects of the creator who have different expressions of service, and they can't serve each other. Like it's mutually exclusive, their desires for service. They can't serve each other. Uh, and so, you know, when we're designing an incarnation, we have goals. And for polarizing entities, I'm assuming those goals would be to continue polarizing positively or negatively. And so finding a situation where you can form a contract where it works for both, um, like Gary said, it doesn't seem like it would work out. Another factor that I think would play into it is the fact that uh, there's, Ross says uh, at one point that negative, negatively polarizing individuals aren't necessarily going to be working with their higher selves. And I think that soul contracts like that would typically be arranged uh, via higher self or at least some sort of system involved in the inner planes like the higher self would be involved and then i forgot the last thing but that oh it is it's actually an important thing um there is an aspect though that i think not everybody that we might assume or view as negatively polarizing in our lives is necessarily going to be negatively polarizing there's one session um a Kuo session a couple of years ago where somebody was asking questions about narcissists. And I, it was really, really good information uh, that Kuo shared about narcissism and how people that we might call narcissists in our life that we have intimate relationships with, like our family, uh, a lot of their behavior seems like something you would describe as service to self polarizing behavior. But according to Kuo, uh, and it makes sense to me, this is much more of a confusion and a choice made by the entity prior to incarnation to have this certain expression in order to have this relationship that challenges them, creates particular catalyst for both them and everybody else in their lives. And so uh, Kuo just gives this orienting information about how to approach situations like that. But I think it's a really important reminder that we may have a soul contract with somebody who might seem to be negative in a sense, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a negatively polarizing entity. And they, they that was a fascinating that. session. I do remember reading that. And anyone who's interested, anyone who knows somebody, maybe a family member who seems to be very narcissistic, if you go to the LNL research website and click on the little magnifying lens in the upper right hand corner. That'll activate the search engine if you type in narcissism or narcissist. Yeah, that that it'll show you the session where that came from. Yeah, highly recommend it. Uh, Langley, did you have any follow up questions? Uh, that? No, that was very enlightening. That cleared up a lot of. It really makes sense the two, the two paths. Like I could see them not wanting to, you know, risk depolarizing by making a contract with the opposite team, uh, if you want. And uh, if you feel called and want to articulate that question in a quote session, uh, please feel free. It's a great question. Really appreciate it. Never thought of it. It sounds like the great premise for a sitcom or for a great uh, Netflix movie or something. I know me personally, I, I'm not sure if I would really ask to be reincarnated with Rasputin or Genghis Khan. It really doesn't sound like my idea of a good time, but... I guess the reward and risk ratio could be great. Yeah. 
Hey, uh, we're going to move on. Sorry to other questions in the chat window. Uh, we've got Joyce and then Grace and then Kathy. Uh, Joyce, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Um, well, I was just wondering how to access Jim McCarty's audio recordings of the raw material, because you said that he had them. But then I went to the and you showed me some uh, a way to access audio recordings, that, but those are Carla and she talks really slow. And I, you know, I heard <laughs> someone said that, you know, Jim McCarty had done it. So I wondered how to find those if anyone knows quickly. Otherwise, I'll just spend a bunch of time on the website and look. No, around. that's a great question. Uh, Gary, you want to respond to that one? Yes, uh, audible.com. If you're looking for Jim's narration of the raw contact, just type in the raw contact at Audible, you'll find it. You could also go to our online store and find it that way. It's okay. highly recommended in case anyone's interested, in my Audible. opinion. Is that Amazon or is that a different place? Audible, Audible is owned by Amazon, but it's an independent website. Oh, okay. And if you want to hear the raw contact in Hebrew, Nelly can help you too. Uh, yeah. No, I don't think that would be helpful to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is worth noting, though, as uh, Joyce pointed out, uh, I believe if you go to, uh, uh, there are recordings of Carla doing the actual channeling, which, of course, comes out a lot slower. But it's fascinating to hear the channeled material as it was actually channeled originally. Maybe that would be the best way. Who knows? I'll uh, it depends. I, I don't think I would want to listen to all 106 sessions that way. That would take a very good self-discipline, I would say. Hey, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Grace, you had a question you wanted to ask? Yes. Um, I think it was um, not so long ago, definitely this year in a channeling that you guys did. Um, Kuo mentions that UFOs are a sort of mythology in themselves. And ever since I read that, I've gotten this like uncomfortable feeling. And I'm thinking back to when um, I believe Carla was uh, channeling Quo and she was asking about, um, I think like the source of Quo and Quo kind of indicated that it was actually in her head. And so I've gotten this like funky feeling about it, um, you know, the UFOs being mythology and kind of wondering if that extends to the idea of aliens being a mythology as well. And maybe what your guys' thoughts were about that. That's a great question. Austin, would you mind fielding that one? Um, I can do my best. Uh, it is definitely something that I'm super interested in, that whole line of questioning. And it's actually that session, that Quo session, that inspired that question um, that I asked during a Quo channeling. And I honestly, I, I don't have a very like well-formed response to that because I think when I read that session and I think about the idea of mythology, um, I even have to take another step back and sort of ask what is mythology in that context even because in that session they talked about even like science is a sort of mythology and so i think when they say mythology in that sense it's bigger than like what you would say greek mythology where there's these sort of very sort of comic book character gods who have distinct personalities but instead is sort of this more fundamental archetypal mythology that frames how we experience the world, how we experience other entities, and how we experience the creator and the creation, and that UFOs are an expression of something that can't be expressed uh, accurately through any real manifestation. Uh, and same thing with aliens, or even you or me as entities. Our expressions here in this realm are illusory, essentially. Um, and so that's what I think they mean by uh, mythology and that UFOs in particular in that context they might incorporate aspects of where we are as a society and express certain aspects of where we are as a society and how they present themselves to get us to ask questions about ourselves and about society in general and where we are why would we be viewing the universe in this way um, and so that's a really broad vague answer but that's about as deep as I can really go off the cuff. It's a great question, and I really appreciated your asking that question of Quo in that session, uh, Austin. Gary, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. I go into these Q&As now more confident 
Um, but I'm really glad Austin answered first because that was excellent. I, I I like how Austin said um, how he, he likened what seemed like a tangible ontologically objective existences like ours, like ETs, like other objects in our material universe as expressions in an illusory realm. Uh, if you to give this some uh, deeper clarity, if you think back to session one of the Ra Contact, Ra says that there you are not part of a material universe. You are dancing thoughts in the mind of the creator. So really our existence is, it seems to be transpiring in uh, the United States or in Europe and in, in 2024 and on this particular planet. But in truth, we are all um, part of a great universal dream. It's as if it might be said, uh, God, as it were, the creator is having a dream and we are its dream characters. Um, but particularly at our, where our nexus of focus is right now on the illusory plane, um, we are at a, at a deep stage of that dream, uh, taking surface appearances to be real, when in fact, like nothing is really what it seems. Uh, according to the data our senses is taking in and the story writing we're making around that data, particularly the great story of separation. I am an individual relating to other individuals. That's false. That is not 100% not true. I am not God. I God, truth, etc. is somewhere else. I need to seek. I need to become. I need to find where spirit is because it is not here. You know, uh, uh, illusion after illusion that we're moving through. And then mythology becomes um, part of that deeper programming, that deeper way of relating to the who to those questions of existence who are we um what is our relationship to the universe what are the role of what are the role of other uh aspects of creation so on and so forth so i'll stop there and add uh briefly uh grace that there the you said you read that session about whereby Carla is channeling and Quo's talking about in your interpretation, kind of being in her head. Um, we spent probably like an hour on that, would you say, Jonathan? Uh, you also- We have discussed that session before, yeah. yeah. I, it might've been our last Q and A or maybe two ago. So yeah, you, if that's an active inquiry for you, you might enjoy that session or if you're looking for a sedative, either way. <laughs> <laughs> it's deep stuff that's for sure grace really appreciate your asking that question did you have any follow-ups on it no that was great thanks guys thank you thank you grace the date of that session in question because i'm looking at it on my screen i want to look it up this is one that i've gone back to and reread quite a few times the date on that session was october 17th 1988 so for anyone who's interested go to the lnl research website uh click on the library and the conscious channeling library and then all the channeling sessions are listed by year just go ahead and find that one and yeah, it's a fascinating uh, uh, discussion. And uh, at some point, Quo said, in our opinion, we are completely within the instrument's mind. Which, I mean, really, I mean, you could interpret that as well. We're just a figment of our imagination. Or it could mean, as I think we discussed in the Q&A, that it just means she was going so deep, deep, deep into her subconscious that she went past the racial mind, past the, past the planetary mind, and like deep into the cosmic mind of which we are all part of, I guess, as Gary was suggesting. Uh, how about, uh, Kathy, you had a question, and then I've got Aram, and then Neely, and then Andy. Uh, Kathy, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thanks, John. Um, uh, so my... Very interesting, and I'm so grateful to be here. And thank you, Austin and Gary. Um, and mine's just a little bit lighter. Uh, and that is, I know all of the planning that goes into to all of your gatherings, whether it's a home in Kentucky or like Prague, you know, next month, and 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 Berlin, and and I know Trish does a lot of that. But uh, all of the planning, and you have a plan, you have a format that you follow, and then you get there, and then that. Um, like Ross says, 
there, um, you know, everything is fine and uh, there's no surprises. And I wonder, Gary and Austin, if you get there and you've got a plan and a, and then there's some surprises. I'm just wondering in, in all of your um, uh, uh, gatherings when you've gotten together and it's supposed to follow this way and it's going to be like this. And then all of a sudden, I'm just wondering yeah. about your surprises, if you had any. You want to start off with that one, Gary? Yeah, uh, Kathy, so we saw each other just a month and a half ago at Rainbow Lodge. It's good to see you too. And thanks for the lighthearted question, or lighter question, I should say. And <laughs> yeah, there's one great memory that stands out that's humorous to me. And then I'll, I'll say something a little bit more sincere, <laughs> but I don't know. This was back before the gatherings really took on the form that they have now. Uh, I was still a little bit more wet behind the ears of planning. Um, anyways, in the er earlier stages, this was like mm, mid 2000s, 2005 to eight, somewhere in that range. And the homecomings were uh, much smaller. I mean, they didn't begin filling up till the, you know, 2016 or so. So I don't know, 25 or so people. So we're gathered in Jim's backyard and it's an outdoor space, summertime setting. And there is a very strong woman there from, I, I, I won't identify her country. Um, but for, not not from the U.S. and, <laughs> and uh, very very freestanding, reliable, um, self assured person who I have and I have a lot of respect for. And um, I think as was she was very comfortable doing. She walked out of the circle and in full view of the rest of us, relieved herself in a corner <laughs> of of the yard. <laughs> <laughs> like nonchalantly like it was nothing and then uh cal calmly returned to the circle and <laughs> <was Wow>. attending <laughs> it was it was uh quite... and it was captured on film right <laughs> yeah. no fortunately uh, <laughs> fortunately not but that that always stands out to me as a surprise um because it was just <laughs> yeah. it was so you weren't planning on that no 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 that would definitely be a surprise <laughs> that would be a surprise but it, not it a mistake. Like, no. Whatever we were doing at the time wasn't disruptive or anything. But um, in terms of like nobody f that I can recall has been really disruptive, uh, knock on wood, maybe some mild disruptions. But in terms of surprise, probably like from a heart level, one of the greatest surprises that I encounter, that we all encounter, is just like how freaking brilliant people are. Like the things that we learn, yes. the 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 stories that they share like the hardships the way they dealt with suffering um it's just we may have had contact over email for years with a person and we meet them in person and there's so much more there's so deeper and uh that's always a very positive surprise and there's not a gathering that goes by without being surprised on that level uh, again and that's again beautiful. austin anything to add I guess just, um, yeah, beautiful uh, answer, Gary. Um, definitely surprises every single time. I think the most notable ones have been for homecoming at Jim's house because it's outside under a tent. And there are lots of things that can happen outside um, that you can't plan for. Uh, weather related specifically, uh, there's been a, a few years where weather has done something to disrupt things. And we always just have to uh, adjust and most notably this past homecoming um, some of you might know that there was a very strong and surprising and sudden nobody knew it was coming um, wall of wind and storms that came through and uh, the short story is knocked over a huge tree that fell on three attendees cars totaling two of them um, and the story is much more harrowing than that, <laughs> but I'll spare the the details. Um, just weather related stuff. That's not the only weather thing that's really gone wrong. One that really stands out to me, I don't know why, is um, Trish used to, uh, because she loved doing it, cook dinner for attendees on Friday evening uh, for homecoming. And so, you know, she's feeding 40 people uh, and has a very rigid plan of like, you know, how things need to go. These things need to go in the oven at this time. And when time came to put lasagna in the oven, the oven did not 
turn on. And so we're like, <laughs> we have to feed people and uh, don't have an oven to oh, heat no. anything up. Um, thankfully, uh, Jim has amazing neighbors and we were able to call on one of his neighbors and run lasagnas up the street and <laughs> put them wow. in a neighbor's oven. Uh, so little things like that always happen every year. You just have to go with the flow and adjust. It's really helpful with experience. Gary's been producing homecomings for many years now. And so just knowing what can go wrong and having contingencies really helps. So uh, Gary's really got it down to a science. And now Trish is really carrying that banner so well. Awesome. Thank you very, very much. What a great question. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I remember hearing about the big tree falling down and really totaling two people's cars. And yeah, nobody was hurt. I was saying, uh, just make that clear. Everybody was okay, except for the cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what a joy that the owners of those cars, including one, I believe that was like a brand new car, if I remember right. But yeah, yeah. really handled it beautifully with grace. And I believe nobody responded the way I think I would have. I think I would have been tweaked a bit. Hey, uh, Claudel, did you have a follow-up question? Someone wanted to ask? Uh, no, not a follow-up question. So I'll wait for this one to be closed at first. Oh, okay. Why don't you go ahead, type your question in the chat window, because we still have uh, Aram, Neely, and Andy, and I think that's all the questions that I saw. Uh, Aram, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah. Hi, guys. It's good to see you, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, I recently read Morris's account of his past life regression, and um, it was on a fourth density planet, and they were they were like sharing a vegan meal together. So I'm just wondering if moving to fourth density means not eating animals and curious whether either of you eat animals and your thoughts on the subject. You want to start with that? Uh, uh, well, Gary, you're more the vegetarian one, are you not? Mm. Yeah, Aram, I feel like an audiobook was just speaking to us. Such a lovely voice. Thank you for the question. And while we can't see you now, it's good to hear you again. Aram was at that uh, home homecoming where cars got uh, themselves. That's there. right. Uh, also, there, uh, quick, quick, quick. There was a homecoming where uh, a storm came in on a Saturday evening while we were out for dinner. We came back and the tent had collapsed. Uh, completely or a half because water had accumulated on top. And so we had to have the gathering outside of the tent the next day. Fortunately, it worked. But um, do entities eat meat in the higher densities? I would say no. And oh, I saw Linda making a correction because Morris's uh, past life experience was on, she went like this, a six density planet. Yeah, it wasn't enough. So we'll not demote Morris to the fourth. <laughs> um, yeah, be, uh, Ra says, even uh, beginning with the fourth density, it is not of a, a chemical uh, complex. They say that they, you know, fourth density entities do need to feed the body complex that persists into the fifth density. At sixth density, Ra has become light, but um, what they're eating is not other second density chemical complexes, to the best of my understanding. And then um, in my own journey with this particular thorny, question with philosophical and ethical implications is that um, back 15 plus years ago on a, a, thanks to in part to a person on bring forth uh, I learned about the brutality of the factory farm system um, I I don't have an ethical issue necessarily with humanely raising and slaughtering meat. I know that can be oxymoronic, particularly to vegans, but in the right manner, I think it can be done properly such that one is in harmony with the animal, with the universe, with the positive polarity, with love and so forth. The factory farm system is not that whatsoever. Um, from my little understanding, animals suffer grievously, grievously, and they are sentient beings and um, tortured, essentially. So when I learned about that, I uh, made a commitment to try to mostly avoid meat. So that's true for Trish and me. We are mostly vegetarians, but I do enjoy it now and then. And if I do enjoy it, I try my best to ensure that it has been ethically, quote unquote, raised insofar as that's possible. You know, that's me trusting a label. 
a, a lot, but that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of my journey. It is a, it makes is sense. a challenging yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, Austin, did you have anything to add? Then I saw Keith had a clarification, a uh, follow-up question. Um, nothing significant. I agree with uh, everything Gary said. I think that it's probably likely that once we continue to evolve into the fourth density, our diets become a lot simpler and probably um, there's less trauma and pain involved in how we are able to sustain our bodies. Uh, for my own part, um, I do have a pretty intimate relationship with the nature of eating meat before I worked with LL Research. I was a small farmer and we raised animals and um, I've slaughtered my own chickens for um, a few years. And so I have a firsthand, you know, experience with raising animals for food, which has given me an appreciation for that kind of cycle of life. And I think that honestly, in a spiritual sense, the most anybody can do is come to terms with their own approach to food. And for vegans and vegetarians, I um, admire the compassion that goes into their choice to avoid eating meat. Um, I've tried both uh, veganism and vegetarianism uh, without success for own health reasons. I do my best to avoid uh, meat. I don't normally cook it at home is how I avoid that, both for spiritual health reasons and environmental reasons too. Um, so there's lots of reasons to at least cut down in meat. Um, and, you know, sometimes a I might eat meat out of convenience. It's not always a very conscious choice, but if we can be as conscious as possible when we do something like eat meat and know what has gone into bringing that meat to us to eat and that there has been pain and suffering involved, even if it's humanely raised, um, I think it's important to remember that and to come to terms with it on your own spiritual journey. Hmm. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Keith, did you have a follow-up question? Well, I just wanted to share um, a, a a perspective that helped, I guess you could say, expanded my perspectives. Uh, it was a book that was written, um, not a channeled book, it was just, uh, as, as far as I know, um, was uh, written a few years ago that that essentially uh, expanded my view on um, uh, essentially looking at plants also as second density, you know, entities and um, and at least uh, opening up the the perspective uh, on. The fact, you know, sort of the broadening the notion that anytime you're eating any kind of second density being, you're eating a tech, second density being, and that's kind of part of the third density experience. That's um, it, it's the way we experience it now. Uh, Lierre Keith is is the name of the author. I think it was the book is called Vegetarian Myth. I can I can pop that in here, but um, I I just thought I'd offer that as a point of view. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate your sharing, uh, folks. I am looking at the clock and I'm seeing I think we're getting close, maybe 10 minutes to, to the end of our hour. And I did want to kind of be mindful of Gary and Austin's time. So uh, I do see three more questions, I believe. And then do you have a pop quiz that I'm sure uh, uh, our guests will enjoy today as well? Uh, Neely, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, it's a really short one. So I was um, going through the LNL Research YouTube channel, as people do. And I bumped into a, it's a promo that Carla recorded for a course, the Law of One course she did at uh, IMU, International Metaphysical University. And I was wondering if you happen to have any recordings of this course or anything? Do you wanna start uh, that one, Austin? Um, we do indeed still have all of the material from that course. It's unfortunately been taken offline for now, but there are plans in place to bring it back online. Um, can't give you a timeline unless Gary has a better idea of a timeline, but um, we do have the materials and uh, there are active uh, plans to get them back up on our website, not IMU. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and available for free. It will... There's a new new website, believe it or not, in the works three years after the the existing new website launched. And it's des being designed to feature these to make these courses available. And Daniel is hoping to get that launched this fall, whether a basic version of that this fall. I don't know if it will include the course at launch, but soon. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, Andy, did you have a question you wanted to ask? 
Sandy here. Andy. Sorry, there. sorry. Yeah, it's fine. I'll ask in Prague. <laughs> I don't want to take up time. <laughs> see you in Prague. Yeah, we'll see you soon, Andy. See you in Prague again. Nice. Yes, I forgot that is coming up. Uh, Claudel, are you there? Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, uh, thank you. I could. I wish I could save my question for Prague, but I won't be there. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy I have the opportunity to ask you there. Hey guys, nice seeing you again. Um, my nice? question, yeah, was around. It's been yeah almost a decade or more for you channeling, um, recording the sessions, going to the the homecomings, the coming homes, and as any humans, I'm sure you have doubt yourself around what you're doing, doubt around the channeling, around the material itself. So I'd love if you could give us a couple of uh, key elements or awardly or not that kind of help you along the path to either cast those doubts away or kind of reinforce the sense of, okay, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're on the right path. Thank you. What a great question. Uh, Gary, would you mind leading off on that one? I think Austin would be great to respond. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Austin, would you like to lead off on that one? Uh, I missed a little bit of the question. Could I get uh, a quick, quick recap? Or Gary, if you go, I can pick it up with context. Go for uh, it. Yeah. Nicely played, Austin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I reverse card. <laughs> <laughs> Jack and me. No, it's, it is, um, Claudio, it's very good to see you. It is a fantastic question. It's just when I wanted to... Uh, to think about while Austin uh, answered. So uh, Austin Claudio was asking about um, our journey and the, you know, which includes some years now of channeling, but serving th various roles through LL Research and um, walking this particularly unique path and w how we have um, learned to let go of doubt in particular. Like that was, that was at the center of your question, right, Claudio? Like doubt itself. Yeah. And, and doubt has been a constant companion on my own journey. There's not a level or a place to which I've grown where doubt's not riding shotgun, uh, sharing its view of myself and my abilities. But I think like you can look back, I mean, look at your own journey, Claudel, and like the just over the continents that you've come uh, three of them, as, as far as I'm aware, and the, the challenges you've had to face at the thresholds and the leaps of faith you had to take and that that voice inside that uh, may have asked you, um, you know, are you sure about this? You think you can really do this? Can you? Uh, but somehow you trust in yourself, maybe even if you don't feel fully confident that you have the abilities to meet the moment or meet what it is you want to do you just nevertheless somehow and i think this is traces back to the archetypes too it is the act of the fool to not know what's ahead to not know if you will survive to not know if you can succeed but what separates quote unquote success from failure is the effort to move forward is the the faith to put the next foot in front of the next foot and the next uh, until you meet your destiny, however that may look for you. And you try to make use of doubt too. Doubt can be a helpful companion. Um, without it, <laughs> we, we might go a little off the rails, a little crazy. We might overestimate uh, what we can do in life. So doubt can help us keep us in check. But it can also, if we energize it too much, and if we wallow in self-doubt, then we limit and handicap ourselves and keep ourselves from the expansion and the learning and the growth that we, we wanted to undertake. Um, my Like everything else, it's really a question of balance largely, isn't it? Right, right. How much? How little? And in, in finding my own balance, just I, I'll wrap it up here. And that's like, if I look back at the kid I was growing up, even me as a teenager, me in my 20s, I never, if you would have showed me the person that I am now and said, you're going to be doing these things. And I don't mean just specifically in relation to LL research, just you know, at the level I am operating, at the capacity I'm operating, that I'm sitting in a circle of 43 people channeling is wild. 
And if you had shown the younger me any of that, who was much more crippled by self-doubt, I would have thought it was the most preposterous thing and impossible for me. But I think I'm not sure of the exact answer, but just incrementally, um, piece by piece, I realize I catalyst is is testing me to show me what strengths I have inside, what abilities I have inside. And then then just by the doing, I come into the trusting of, okay, I can, I do have certain abilities. I can do this. And it's never extinguished doubt whatsoever, but it's helped me help that which is not doubt to be stronger and have even more faith that I can move forward. It's a big subject, but that's that's me for now. Thank you for the great question. That's a beautiful uh, personal response. Thank you for sharing that, Gary. Uh, Austin, any thoughts, reflections to share on that? Yeah, thank you for going. First, Gary, it's a very inspiring response. I am essentially on the same page as Gary, self-doubt, doubt in general. Um, it's a constant companion, but I, it's something I've contemplated a lot. You know, it's being a constant companion. It's been uh, the center of a lot of my spiritual seeking, trying to understand it. And so... Uh, the way that I relate to something like doubt now is to really focus on it as a catalyst. And in my life, what doubt is sort of catalyzing, you know, you throw doubt into the mix, then what is the transformation happening? Um, it's helping me to challenge faith, essentially. Um, there's only so much intellectualizing and thinking and contemplating you can do about any particular thing to try to like get rid of the doubt. But in my experience at the end, the doubt's still going to be there. And so how do you take that next step? The only thing that um, has ever worked for me is faith. And then looking back at my life and in examples of other people's lives, think what is the worst thing that could happen? Have I always made the right choice? Have I always taken a step that led me to something great? The answer is no. Sometimes the doubt has been right, that you weren't able to accomplish this thing, but it doesn't mean that that isn't important in your journey, that if you have doubt and you take the step and it doesn't go the way that you think it's supposed to, then you pick up the pieces, figure out what the lesson was there and continue moving forward and learn that that doubt may have been telling you something that seems true in the moment, but taking that step was still essential on your spiritual journey. It still got you to a point of growth and transformation that um, you couldn't see at the moment that you were doubtful and uh, you just needed to take that step. And so that's really the biggest aspect of doubt for me is that it helps to exercise faith and help to remind me about faith and the importance of it on the spiritual journey, that we can't know everything. We can't plan for every little thing. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's my response. That's beautiful. Thank you both. I appreciate your both uh, the vulnerability and openness and being able to speak about something that's got to be, I would assume, difficult to talk about. But I'm glad that you both do have the doubts because I, I would frankly be more concerned if you went into channelings without having any doubts. I would think I would probably be kind of concerned about that. Uh, Claudel, did you have any follow up questions on that? It's a, it's a beautiful question. Thank you. No, we're good. We're good. I think we have it on record that Gary and Austin said that they don't doubt that they can be really amazing dancers. So on the next <laughs> coming, there'll be music and they don't doubt their ability to dance. So that's why I, <laughs> I think there is an air and Thank transmission you. here. <laughs> Thank you, Claudio. <laughs> Always nice to have something to look forward to. <laughs> well, I, I believe that was the last question in the chat window, and we have just about right. enough time to ask you a couple more good questions. If you thought the yeah, questions yeah, so far I, were I, I uh, good. I a question in the chat, but I understand if, if time's up, time's up, I understand, but I thought I'd be sure I put a question in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, go That's for it. About social memory I'm sorry, comments. Keith. Yeah, go for it. Is it, I, again, I don't, I don't want to drag it on too long, if it's, I guess, referring to Austin, Gary. I'm uh, how are you doing for a time, Austin, Gary? Okay. So, uh, and, and again, you may say this is going to take too long to answer, but I'll, I'll frame it first by uh, disclosing or uh, sharing that I have this intuition about what um, what I'm doing musically. Um, and just very in brief, I have this intuition that it's possible to create, uh, I guess, I, I wouldn't call it social memory complex, but sort of pop up social complexes around sharing music and love and doing that with the intention going in to do that. Um, so that led me to a broader question. I wasn't able to find anything in the channel and doing, you know, doing a search 
that talks about the, this notion of creating uh, a social complexes in third density, whether they be ephemeral or sort of durable. Um, and I guess the question is, do you recall any material on that topic? And if even if you don't, do you have any sort of extemporaneous thoughts you can share on it? On that topic, is it is that a clear enough question? I, I realize I'm, I'm concerned it wasn't clear enough. I think we're good. Uh, Austin, you right. want to take the lead on this one? Um, well, I, just a clarifying question. So you're talking about social complexes in third density. So maybe something akin to like a social memory complex that's more temporary in third density, where there's like a group that has a deeper connection, um, yeah. sort yeah. of based on yeah, social yeah. memory complex. A, deep, a deeper connection. And again, so I, I was trying to make the question as brief as possible, so I left out some some nuance. It, it was uh, really around a specific intention, whether it's an intention for healing, an intention for peace, or an intention for, you know, fill in the blank of you know service to others, things that we might want to manifest more. Uh, with the idea being that. Uh, with the multiplier effect, you could just have much more efficaciousness. You know, you could be much more effective than um, than even you know uh, in groups like imagining hundreds of people doing the same thing. So um, does that make sense, Austin? Yeah. Okay. I think that's enough. Um, I wish I had a, a better answer, but the things that are coming up for me at the moment in terms of material, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but um, we are friends with a group in Asheville called Temple of the Open Heart that I think they do a lot of work around this sort of thing, building community, but building community in a very intentional way that incorporates spirituality and, and specifically the law of one. And so um, they might have some leads. Uh, if you look at their website, it's toto.org, T-O-T-O-H dot org um and they're enthusiastic about i think this general concept that you're talking about and yeah. then just a reflection on the nature of what you're sharing is i you know absolutely social complexes like what you're talking about i think can and do exist uh, in various forms but i think the biggest barrier you know is obviously we're in third density we right. are veiled um in my understanding, the thing that really helps the social memory complex and fourth density be cohesive is a unified intention of everybody in the social memory complex. And it's impossible to know that in third density. It's even impossible to know our own unconscious intentions in third density. Mm -hmm. So I think there's always going to be a bit of a handicap or a handicap, quote unquote, but it's really the point of third density, that we aren't supposed to necessarily all work cohesively. We have to have the friction to create the catalyst to help us transform. So uh, I definitely think it's possible and uh, there are sustaining social complexes like that and um, it's a worthy cause to pursue, uh, but third density is always gonna do third density things, I think. <laughs> Anything to add, Gary, other yeah. than a chuckle? I just like their density is gonna gonna beat their density. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the answer to so many gonna questions. Do their density is gonna, gonna third. I think that's yeah. the, the point. Shape it. <laughs> yeah, I I do have a response. And um, real briefly, I wanted to add to my response to Claudel previously. That Claudel has seen me now a couple of times perform the cold open of gatherings, and I'm standing in front of people, and I'm trying to make them laugh here and there when I can. But, you know, my job is to welcome and orient. In that moment, I have, am, uh, doubt is so permeating me that part of me is utterly convinced that I am lame and that everybody looking back at me knows it or is thinking the same thing because I'm projecting it out on to their eyes. And it's only as I start to talk more and warm up. And then as the gathering goes on, I feel more relaxed and feel more that I, I can be me, but uh, I wish I knew how to, um, how to extinguish that. Uh, to the Have you considered that... opening with a little bit of heads, shoulders, knees, and toes? <laughs> I, I, who would do that to <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> to that <laughs> Somebody whose name rhymes with Rodell. Rod <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um uh Keith, did that answer your uh or I'm sorry, uh Gary, did you have yeah, no? yeah, sorry for the uh, the extra space. Uh Austin landed on the key thing, and that's uh unifying intention. And I wanted to say that you know, Ra describes a group at the end of the second density, se not second density, uh, second major cycle, the, the second 25,000 year cycle in third density who were harvestable 
on Earth, like 150 beings in South America who had achieved that 51% vibratory rate that made them harvestable. Uh, I imagine that they all had uh, something approaching a social memory complex in the third density context due to their exquisite harmony. And they're, they're all kind of on the same page. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just one of this group or a few of them, it was the group itself. So they all must have been really cohesive. And uh, Rod describes that um, it is that factor, this unifying of an intention that forms a social memory complex and uh, is that which glues and binds the confederation together like mm. that's that's the key criteria and one has has to mm -hmm. realize that the purpose of their existence is this evolution and service to others and dedicate themselves to to that purpose so the third density environment if you like were to look at it on an energetic level i think it would look kind of you just see whirlpools and eddies mm. and uh, kaleidoscopic chaos to a degree because we are so as Ra's word was scattered scattered across the spectrum so it's really hard just to hold it takes a lot of l, l a lot of will and persistence just to hold one's own perseverance and own path when there's so much uh competing for our attention so much trying to distract us so much pulling us into the gravity well of yeah. indifference to do that with multiple people mm -hmm. is all the more uh, multiple is all the more difficult right for sure any follow-ups on that, Keith? We I'm going to defer my follow-ups because I could. Uh, we're way over time, and I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate your question. Yeah, and hope to see you next time too. Thank you. Keith. Uh, yes, indeed, we are running just a wee bit over time, so I did want to uh, thank Gary and Austin again for their time uh, and being here with us today. And as you all know, um, pop quiz was a term that Carla used to refer to the little tests and surprises that we get in our daily rounds to see if we are, in fact, learning the lessons that we came here to learn in this incarnation. Uh, and in these uh, little sessions, we like to do pop quizzes just to kind of uh, add a little bit of light and levity to otherwise pretty serious metaphysical discussions uh, and to uh, tie in the law of one to a little bit of pop culture. So uh, Austin and Gary, today we're going to do the pop quiz a little bit of different. Today, I'm going to ask you three open-ended questions about a particular topic, uh, each of which have a fairly uh, exact numerical answer. So for uh, each one, uh, we will see who comes up with the closest uh, answer. First of all, uh, are you familiar with uh, common law of one abbreviations, abbreviations like STO for service to others and STS for service to self? And are you familiar with uh, ST for space time and time space? Today, uh, we are going to test your knowledge of some common texting abbreviations. <laughs> so as I said, uh, we're gonna do the quiz a little bit differently. I'm gonna ask you three questions about common texting abbreviations, but these are not multiple choice questions. It's just open-ended uh, question. And the answer to each question is a fairly uh, exact numerical answer. So whoever guesses a closer answer than the other person gets the point. So it doesn't matter, uh, not that you guys are competitive or anything like that, but uh, somebody's gonna get the point on each question regardless of, of what you say. Does that make sense to you? You guys ready to start? Let's you go. know what I'm, I'm familiar with is, I'm familiar with having won this game at Rainbow Lodge in Seattle. So I don't, I don't know if I'm subject to it anymore. Wasn't that the prize? <laughs> No, unfortunately, that was a non-scoring game. None of the scores oh, didn't count in that game. <laughs> it was totally off the record. It is not on YouTube, so it doesn't count. All right. But this one counts big time. Uh, and again, folks watching in Zoom, uh, you can um, put your answers in the chat window if you want. Folks watching on YouTube, you can just say the answers to yourself if you want. All right. Uh, otherwise, your first question is this. What year was the first recorded use of the abbreviation OMG for Oh My God? Austin, Gary, any guesses? I'm going to say 1996. 1923. Nice guess. Why'd you say 1923? 
uh, that's what came to me. <laughs> oh, hey, no fair. You can't be like channeling social memory complexes <laughs> here for your answers. That's yeah. totally cheating. You are going to totally have to repeat third density for that. That is pretty good, though. The correct answer is, in fact, 1917. Ah! 1917. According to the International Churchill Society, uh, uh, the first no use known of that acronym was uh, in a letter written to Winston Churchill in 1917 while he was serving as first Lord of the Admiralty in the British Navy. Mm -hmm. The letter was written by a John Fisher who as first Sea Lord, the Navy's highest ranking officer, often quarreled with Churchill. And in the 1917 letter, Fisher wrote, I hear that a new order of knighthood is on the tapas, meaning table, OMG, parentheses, oh my God, shower it on the Admiralty. <laughs> he was being playfully sarcastic, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for whatever reasons, nobody else picked up on it until I believe it was in the 1990s that yeah, caught on as a text thing. Yeah, he clearly had to spell it out what it said. So <laughs> yeah, nobody. Uh, back in the day, I, acronyms go back. Uh, you know, there's letters during, you know, the colonial period of America where they address each other using uh uh, like a monogram for their names and so forth. So I figured it probably is older than texting for sure. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, well, not that we're keeping score or anything, but if we were, you got the first point there, Gary. Do you guys remember, just out of curiosity, do you, either of you remember any big OMG moments when you like first realized the law of one was like really something life changing? Mm. Do you remember, uh, Austin, any particular moments uh I, the first thing that comes to my head is not directly related to the law of one but the biggest omg moment i had was the point on my journey where uh, edgar mitchell astronaut nasa astronaut oh, was talking about how ufos were real um and up to that point that's not something i'd ever considered would ever come out of the mouth of a nasa astronaut and so that was big omg moment for me nice gary yeah, 18 years old, reading Fingerprints of the Gods, and suddenly the lid was blown open, and I saw humanity as this species with amnesia and the world so full of mystery. It was my first uh, stepping outside of the Matrix, as it were, stepping outside of slumber. How old were you at the time? 18 years old. Nice. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. You guys ready for your next question? Bring right. It. Your next question is, ah, bloody hell. <laughs> you didn't see that. Uh, what year, sorry, I, uh, what year was the first recorded use of the abbreviation FYI for For Your Information? Honestly, didn't see anything on the, Go the screen. Uh, I'm going to go further back in time, say 1712. <laughs> <laughs> AD or BC? <laughs> AD. AD. Okay. And... For your information, this seems like a very uh, practical, pragmatic thing that goes hand in hand, maybe with the world of commerce. Um, so I'm going to go 40s, 1940s. No, World War II. I'm going to go, uh, yeah, 1940, let's say. Nice. I like how both of you are approaching this. This is very uh, uh, great. Uh, indeed, the correct answer is uh, in the 1930s. According to Grammarly, the term can be traced back to the 1930s when it was used by journalists to indicate that the messages they sent by wire or parts of the message were for the eyes of the person receiving the message, mm. not for further publication. Pretty good yeah. indeed. May I ask, uh, what do you think, uh, Gary, is like the most important piece of information you've received from our friends in the Confederation? Like, do you have any favorite passages or any, um, I don't know, what do you think is the most important piece of information you've received from our friends in the Confederation? I know you thought the Q&A was over, but the, the, the pop quizzes are really just a Trojan horse for like the extra questions we ask at the end. And I mean, if none come to mind, you can just say none and that's fine. I was just curious. 
No, it's just that there's so much. Um, yeah, just it's a, a, in general, the possibilities of evolution, healing, and transformation that we are not these we're we're not um bound to our old stories of self and to our the costumes that we wear whether it's nationality ethnicity gender or so forth but we have limitless potential within to realize ourselves as the one to dissolve the illusions and so forth i mean we are limited to a degree by the role that we chose you know i'm i'm not going to transform into a uh, anyway and, and you know into arnold schwarzenegger per se but <laughs> anything is um, possible yeah austin any thoughts on that yeah the biggest what i always say the biggest you know piece of information that was useful in my spiritual journey was uh just the framing of our experiences as catalyst and that you know we're not victims of our life you know everything that happens to us can be mined for transformation and not only that but that transformation is typically the opening of the heart i think that's uh has always stuck with me as the biggest thing that i take away from the law of one that's beautiful thank you so much for uh, sharing one last question are you ready yeah. what year was the first recorded use of the abbreviation idk for i don't know uh 2001 Mm, yeah, I'm, that that feels a little bit more contemporary to me too. But um, I gotta go a little below Austin. Ninety five. Good guess. Correct answer is nineteen eighteen. <laughs> Believe it or not, according to a nineteen eighteen article in the Wichita Beacon, the phrase "IDK" for "I don't know." was something that World War I era American infantrymen said to harass new guys in the unit. Uh, they just said uh, it's the latest slang for um, in reply to fool questions asked by recruits and men who have just been landed. Fascinating. I guess there really wasn't that much else to put in the news back in 19, I guess. <laughs> really uh, fascinating, though. So uh, last question on this, uh, Austin. Any big questions you still wonder about? Anything you still don't know that for whatever reason you haven't found out from Quo or our friends in the Confederation? Uh, yeah, like where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where are Bigfoot's caves? Um, all of that stuff is still uh, up in the air. They just won't tell us. I don't know why. Gary? Yeah, uh, particularly as... Uh, History is a great love of mine and uh, mysteries of a historical nature, particularly a, an original civilization on this planet that was wiped out through cataclysm and forgotten through history, but left its marks around the world in the form of, you know, megalithic stonework and oral story and myth and so forth. More about Atlantis. Where where was that? Was that in the Caribbean? Was that uh, Indonesia pre rise of, you know, during the Ice Age? And global sea levels were, were higher, were lower, sorry, something like that. That would be a fascinating. I am fascinated by Atlantis too, mm -hmm. for sure. And there's so much that's already been written about Atlantis from Dolores Cannon. I remember reading some of her books as pretty trippy stuff and yeah. Edgar Casey too. Well, I don't know why you guys choose to do the <laughs> sit in for these pop quizzes time after time, but I sure do uh, appreciate your being here and especially going uh, over time uh, to today. Uh, before we say goodbye, uh, Austin, did you have any last thoughts, reflections wanted to share before we part ways? Uh, just that I uh, really, really appreciate you, Jonathan, and everybody here. Everybody watching at any point in time, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of your your space and your spiritual journey. And uh, this is something Gary normally gets a chance to say before, and he's so good at saying it, but I'm going to take a crack at it. Um, don't listen to us. <laughs>
maybe not that extreme, but you know, there's nothing exceptional. I think is how Gary says it. Uh, nothing exceptional about us as individuals. We have a unique experience. And so um, we understand that you might find that unique experience interesting, but we are no better, no different from anybody else on the path like you. And so uh, it's an honor to be in this position. Um, but like Carla always said, we are just bozos on the bus. We're all bozos on the bus. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Beautifully said. Uh, Gary, any last thoughts, reflections you want to share? Yeah. Other positively oriented people make life work worth living. This uh, planet wouldn't, uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't still be standing upright if it weren't for other beautiful people and getting to cross paths with you in this context and uh, talk about the law of one is a, a privilege and an honor and a joy. And uh, thank you all so much. And if you live in America, vote on, in November. <laughs> Indeed. Love you guys both so much. Uh, thank you for uh, all you've done and continue to do in service to others. For folks on the Zoom call, uh, we will stop recording, but we'll go on for a little bit longer if you want to stick around to hang out and debrief. We can do that and let uh, Gary and Austin go on their way. Otherwise, uh, again, uh, to all our friends in LNL Research, thank you for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. For all of you who took time out of your lives to join us on the Zoom call today, thank you for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. Those of you watching this on YouTube or on video in the near future or the far distant future, we are thanking of you too, sending and receiving our love. Uh, until next time, in the love and light of the one infinite creator, Adonai, Namaste. You're awesome, Jonathan. Thank you. And thank you for the pop quiz, too. It was fun. <laughs> Love you all.